Good afternoon and welcome to the Easter Seals Project Action Webinar, Developing Effective Practices for Snow Removal, Why It Is Worth All the Effort. All participants will know it's an only mode. There will be an opportunity to ask questions during today's presentation. At that time, an operator will give instructions on how to ask your question. If you have, if you need assistance during the conference, please press star, then zero on your touchtone phone. This conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Kristen McLaughlin. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, welcome, everybody, to today's session on snow removal. Uh, before we begin the session, I do want to get a few housekeeping items out of the way. Um, the PowerPoint presentation uh, for today's session can be found on the website. Um, we did just put the final presentation on there a few moments ago. Um, we did have uh, um, uh, almost the final version put up early this morning, uh, and I apologize to everybody for the late uh, 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 posting of that PowerPoint. But um, the final PowerPoint is available on the event website now. Um, so you can go there uh, to uh, download that and send it out if you'd like to. Um, the event is also being recorded and transcribed, and you can visit our website, which is projectaction.org. Um, usually, uh, within a couple of weeks, we'll have that available, but definitely within 30 days, that will be available for download. Uh, and if you would like to receive a copy in Braille or audio CD, um, you can email that request to webinars at easterseals.com. Uh, and if you do that, be sure to send us your postal address. We also have closed captioning available for the event today. Um, the link for that is on your screen. And I'm also going to ask one of my colleagues to put that into the chat section um, so that you can uh, click on that directly. Um, once you have opened the uh, closed captioning screen, however, I, I will mention that you may want to minimize the screen so that you can see both the screen and the PowerPoint together. They are two separate screens. Um, so with that, I want to uh, introduce our speakers for today's session. Um, today we have Russ Becker, the Facilities Manager from Roar and Ford Transportation Authority uh, in Aspen, Colorado. Um, we also have Roger Millar, the Vice President of Smart Growth America, and Donna Smith, uh, the Director of Training from Easter Seal Project Action. Um, and one thing I'll say uh, is that thank you to Russ especially for, for joining us. They're actually having a snowstorm right now. How appropriate is that? Um, and he's calling in today from uh, his truck. So um, he's actually out removing snow and took the time to call in from his truck to, to present to us today. So thank you for that. Um, also, before we get started, I do want to mention that Easter Seals Project Action um, is a technical assistance center uh, that strives to provide accurate information on the ADA, or in other words, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, what we provide is technical assistance and not legal advice. Um, so in other words, it doesn't carry the force of the law. What we aim to, to do is to provide solutions using the, uh, the ADA uh, and other federal regulations as a baseline. Uh, we would like to follow the presentation uh, with questions from you. Um, so following the presentation, we will receive additional instructions from Stephanie on how you can ask your questions to the presenters. Um, we had originally uh, uh, decided to start the presentation today with Donna. Um, but uh, because Russ is uh, in, in an interesting situation in his truck um, in the process of removing snow, um, we are going to let him go first. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Russ and let him uh, talk about uh, what they do to remove snow in Aspen. Hi, this is Russ. Um, the photos you guys are seeing currently, uh, this is the current snowstorm. It started at 1 o'clock this morning. And uh, I've been out working since 1, and my crew's been out working. Uh, as you can see, on some of the shelters, there's, there's treads all along the curb line, which you can see in one, and in, at the buttermilk stop, all these pictures were taken in Aspen, by the way. The one at buttermilk is still, it's still covered in snow, and, uh, you know, we've been at this since 1 o'clock in the morning. It's snowing all day. We've got about 16 inches as it is, and it's still snowing. And I've got, uh, I think I've got eight guys, eight trucks plowing, and two service companies plowing. I also have uh, four shovel crews getting ready to go to work as the snow is slowing down a little bit. Our first uh, objective in the course of the day, as you can see, you see the various um, uh, ADA access ramps and they're all covered in snow. We actually have 24 hours to get them clean. 
but we try to get them clean as soon as possible because we got a lot of wheelers that ride up here, and uh, it's really tough for them to get around in situations like we currently have. I mean, you can see the smell that's coming down and the snow around us. And uh, we make a really big effort uh, to make sure all our ramps are cleared within 24 hours. And as you can see, on the loading tread platforms, they're all cleared already. Most of them are cleared by now. That, that's the big station at uh, Brush Creek that shows the big, long tread pattern for the wheelers to get traction and get up into the buses and stuff. So we take this very seriously. I've got, like I said, uh, probably 25 people working and moving snow today uh, between shoveling and, and plowing. And it's our objective to make it safe and, uh, you know, a good experience for all riders, not just the ADA riders, but all of our riders. Um, that's about all I have. Like I said, you know, I'm sorry I, I got this kind of short little presentation, but like I said, we were hit a snowstorm and it just kind of threw everything right out the window of what I was planning to do. But these are current pictures and you can see the skiing is going to be fabulous as of Friday. So if you got any chance to come up to ask and come on up. We know the bus and ramps will all be clear and uh, the skiing will probably be fantastic this weekend. Thank you. All right, thank you, Russ, very much. Um, so, Donna, we'll go back to you. Um, let me get back to your initial slide here. You can start whenever you're All ready. Right. Very good. Well, I just want to say a big thank you to Russ for uh, still taking the time out to call in on our, our call today. Um, Project Action did not have anything to do with the snowfall in Aspen, uh, no matter how appropriate it might be for our webinar today. Uh, but uh, it looks like uh, you guys have it under control up there and you're getting things cleaned off as quickly as you can and, uh, and then you'll have some uh, good, uh, good skiing as well. So uh, that's all really good and um, we, we may be a little off, uh, uh, off our game a bit on this webinar today again because of some uh, interruptions, not just not just Russ's uh, interruption of snow, but there's been several things that have kind of gone on uh, that have um, uh, led up to some last-minute changes on our webinar. So we're going to work our way through it and see uh, what we can do, which is basically what you have to do in a snowstorm is, uh, you know, all hands on deck and see what you can do uh, to make the best of a situation and, and make it so that it, it works for everybody. So thank you so much for uh, joining us on the call. And I'm going to get started on a few things that may back us up just a little bit in terms of some introductory remarks. All right, so um, certainly many people, uh, both with and without disabilities, uh, do not drive. Um, and uh, as a result, uh, they depend on other forms of transportation, and public transit is certainly a big one, uh, but also on friends and relatives to drive them around, and they, they depend on this kind of transportation for everything. So. Um, uh, getting uh, workers, uh, home health workers uh, into the homes, uh, getting deliveries made, uh, getting out and about to take care of their business, to go grocery shopping, etc. cetera. Um, uh, many things uh, are dependent on the availability of public transportation for those of us who don't drive. Um, and in some cases, it can be um, a pretty significant uh, uh, life situation, such as receiving needed uh, medical treatment, those sorts of things. Um, also, as a result, then, um, the uh, uh, addition of snow uh, under these cir circumstances uh, can make these things even more difficult. So one of the pictures that you're seeing now um, is a few days after a snowstorm, um, and this is in New Jersey. Um, but yes, you can see that the uh, sidewalks and the, the curb ramps, those things are still not cleared off and still inaccessible. Um, and this particular woman who needed to get to the pharmacy um, is out in, in uh, traffic with her uh, wheelchair trying to get out and about. Um, and she uh, ultimately was not able to make this trip on her, on her own and had to call a friend to come and kind of uh, help her out. Um, and uh, he, he took this picture and, and wanted, to, wanted it to be used to uh, show how uh, significant this sort of situation can be. We have a couple more pictures here for you. Uh, the first one on this slide is taken from uh, Mammoth, California. 
Um, and uh, you can see that the uh, bus stop is uh, is uh, all uh, snowed under, um, and that people are having to wait for the bus out in the street. And, and for any place where it snows, this is probably not too unusual uh, a scene for you to to see. The second one um, was taken in Grand Rapids, uh, Michigan, and it's a situation where the uh, Sidewalk is very icy, um, and having to uh, get uh, from the, having this woman to be able to get from her apartment um, out to the bus stop was something that she was working on very hard so that she could have independent travel. Um, and you can see uh, that that, uh, that through this picture that that's a very slippery and dangerous situation. So again, um, another type of situation that I'm sure that uh, <coughs> we have uh, all witnessed at one time or another. During a um, during a snowstorm or, or icing, so I want to uh, talk a little bit about um, talk a little bit about the ADA and sidewalk maintenance. Um, section thirty five point one three three of the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, is a, a reference to regulations within Title II, um, and they do address this issue of sidewalk maintenance. Um, on the FHWA's, that's the Federal Highway Administration website, um, there is a um, there is a a Q and A, a question and answer about uh, the requirements for keeping pathways cleared and in and in good repair, uh, keep them maintained, um, and. Uh, there's a lot of information that you can gain from uh, look, going and, and looking through this uh, Q&A if you want to, and we've given you the link to it here um, on the PowerPoint slides. And, uh, and, and if you downloaded it, you have that link. If, if you need it, you can certainly email us. We'll be happy to send it to you directly. But I just want to cover a little bit of the information that you would find in the Q&A if you go and look there. So first of all, Federal, state, and local government agencies all have responsibility to provide pedestrian access for people with disabilities under both the ADA and or Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when there's a situation where a public uh, where public lands, uh, there, there's a, a, a public-private partnership between public land and a private uh, uh, entity who has leased that land, um, then the, the requirements for maintaining uh, walkways still fall under the Title II requirements um, of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Title II, we know, impacts uh, public lands, public uh, uh, agencies. And uh, so the, when there's a title, uh, when there's a, a private entity that is leasing public land, uh, they still have that level of responsibility under Title II, and they, uh, that should be covered in the lease agreement between uh, the public entity and the private entity that says if you lease this land and you are responsible for maintaining at this level. Uh, ultimately, though, the responsibility co comes back to the public entity whose lands it is um, in the end. But they can certainly uh, go to and, and, and uh, insist that <coughs> one of the requirements, <coughs> excuse me, one of the um, one of the requirements for leasing that land um, is that the private entity must maintain at the Title II level. Um, if it's a private land, so if it's all under private ownership, then they still have responsibility for pedestrian access. Uh, for people with disabilities, but it's under Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So there's a lot of coverage under the ADA that addresses um, uh, public walkways and uh, uh, the accessibility of those public walkways um, under both Title II and Title III of the ADA, and again under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, which impacts uh, federal uh, agencies. Um, another bit of information that you'll find on the FHWA website is that a public entity must maintain its walkways in an accessible condition with only temporary interruptions in accessibility. So this is saying we understand that temporary things are the things that can, hap can happen, such as a snowfall, uh, that's going to uh, render uh, a heretofore accessible pathway inaccessible. But 
uh, it, it can only be a temporary situation. It has to be something that is addressed. And we just heard Russ say that uh, they uh, get out and clean their sidewalks and, and ADA ramps off uh, within 24 hours or sooner if they can. Um, so this maintenance of walkways and keeping them clear of obstructions um, is, uh, it certainly includes uh, any re reasonable efforts to remove snow. <coughs> All right, so Easter Seals uh, created a brief on snow removal. Um, one of the reasons that we decided to hold this conference, uh, this webinar call, and as well as create a publication on snow removal is that almost any time we have um, uh, a training session that deals with accessible pathways or any time that we're doing things within our uh, scope of our travel training projects where we're talking about uh, assisting people to learn how to assess and navigate pathways of travel. <coughs> um, the issue of snow removal, what happens when it snows and what happens when it's icy always comes up. It's always a question, it's always a concern. Um, and there wasn't much out there that seemed to address this specifically. Although I think we're starting to see an increase in that um, uh, with a little bit more attention being given to the needs of pedestrians and cyclists uh, with regard to uh, clear <coughs> pathways as well as for uh, the driving public. So we created a brief called Effective Snow Removal uh, for Pathways and Transit Stops. Uh, and you'll see a picture of our uh, publication here. Um, and we did uh, decide to create this because it is a tremendous barrier to independent travel. And there are certainly some parts of our country where this happens more often than in others. Um, some of the things that you will find on this brief are uh, information such as um, some innovative practices, uh, that includes some partnerships that have been developed. Again, we just heard Russ talking about how he had his own crews out uh, cleaning, but then he also uh, had some uh, private crews uh, cleaning as well. So looking at some partnerships for snow removal, um, policies and legislation. So we address the issues uh, that that um, that may occur in some kind of sometimes in state legislation, sometimes in uh, uh, local city ordinances about um, snow removal. So, the, and then there can be certainly just some policies that are set. Um, community groups that deal with these things, and again, the information on ADA sidewalk maintenance. And we're going to be referring to this brief off and on uh, as we go through um, our slides today. So this is just a slide that we put in for a little bit of levity here about what might what it might look like if pedestrians had clout. Uh, and so here we see that the uh, the streets and the and the and the cars are all covered over with snow, but the pedestrians are walking along with no problem at all on cleared sidewalks. Uh, uh, yeah, we don't see that happen. All right, uh, next slide. Um, so there are uh, a couple things that I want to I want to do in the interest of a uh, full disclosure here before I get into the next uh, portion of my um, uh, presentation. Um, if we were in a face-to-face -face meeting, one thing that you would know about me is that uh, I'm a person with a vision disability and that I use a, a guide dog. And so you see my uh, dog uh, there on the on, in the pictures. Um, uh, both being a, a good guide dog in one of them and uh, being a dog playing in the snow uh, and in her coat and, and booties, which I have to tell you she absolutely hates. So she looks a little sad in that picture, that's why. Uh, but I, I want you to know that that's the perspective that I intend to talk from uh, for a little bit. Um, I've al I also, though, have a good proficiency with using the long white cane as an O&M um, a tool as well. So uh, I'll talk from that perspective as well. I often go uh, a length of time between dogs uh, for any reason, and any of a number of reasons, um, and so I'm proficient with the cane as well. Um, the other thing that I, uh, you would know about me if we were meeting face to face um, is that I've been traveling independently for quite a long time uh, and way before the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So uh, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about in the next few slides uh, builds on that experience or pulls from that experience. 
<clears throat> so, um, a disproportionate number of people with disabilities certainly rely on public transportation and pedestrian pathways for our independent mobility. And um, you know, while there are some folks out there that choose to use public transportation uh, because they don't want to drive their car, or they don't want to pay high parking fees, or because they feel like it's better for the environment, or any of a number of reasons, um, it's not a choice for me and many other people with disabilities. It's a necessity. Um, and I actually plan my life around transportation. So everything I do, including where I live, where I work, uh, where I shop, um, uh, which bank I choose, all of these things are planned around my ability to travel independently to and from them. And this doesn't change when it snows. I still have to get out and go to work. I still have to get groceries. Um, and I still need to be able to walk around and use public transportation. Um, Russ just talked a bit about <coughs> some of the issues with um, snow and how it's going to impact the uh, public transportation in general. And uh, in a few minutes, we hope to hear from uh, Roger Millar, who's going to talk about it from a complete street uh, perspective, as well as someone who's uh, been out and about uh, in, in the world dealing with snow from a, at the municipal level. Um, hi, but I'm good. hi, it's Roger. Oh, good. Roger's on with us. Thank you, Roger. So we'll be hearing from Roger in just a few minutes. Um, and then, uh, but I plan to focus on the impact that it has on the mobility of people who are blind or visually impaired. Um, and uh, I'll also mention some of the issues about how the, uh, what kind of impact snow has on people with other types of disabilities as well. But obviously mm -hmm. the one that I know best uh, is the impact of, of snow on, on people who are blind or visually impa impaired. So what does it do? What does snow do? What does a snowfall do for me when I'm out and about? First of all, it affects sound. So whenever I open my door and I step outside, get ready to go somewhere, and even if there's just a small bit of snow, even just a couple inches of snow, um, it's as though everything's been muffled outside. So all of the sound cues that I typically use um, or ju they just don't sound the same as they used to. So that things may sound farther away. Things that I that used to uh, be kind of close up, um, you know, don't sound like that anymore. Um, and uh, so you might want to think about it as in terms of. Uh, what does it sound like if you put on a hat that covers your ears or you wrap up with a scarf that covers your ears and it automatically starts to kind of um, uh, tone that sound down for you or if you put in headphones, those kinds of things. Um, any, that, that's the same effect that snow has for me in many ways. So then the other thing that snow, a little bit of snow on the ground can do is that it affects what I feel under my feet. And the more snow there is, the more that's a problem. Um, however, it, it really just has to be, a, again, a couple of inches of coverage in order for it to become a problem. A lot of the cues that I use when I travel independently are things like the slope of a sidewalk, where cracks are, uh, the edge between the, the um, sidewalk and grass, uh, where the curb is. So sometimes it can snow enough that it covers entirely the difference between the sidewalk and a, and a driveway or the street or a parking area uh, because it's higher than the edge of the, of the curb is. Um, I also depend on being able to note you know, the dips in the sidewalk under my feet. There are a lot of little nuances about sidewalks that you may not pay a lot of attention to if you don't need to, but they're cues for me about where I am. And so just a little bit of snow can, uh, can, can wipe out those cues for me, basically takes them all away. It covers them all up. Um, so these variables alone uh, are enough to get me off track. Um, and I can truly miss my destination point and literally within just a few feet of it and not know that I'm there um, and feel like I'm, I'm really disoriented and, uh, and don't know um, uh, how to, to get to the exact spot I'm trying to get to. And I don't have to be that far off for this disorientation to happen. Um, 
you know, I try to compensate for it by knowing that these are uh, things that I'm going to have to experience and I maybe move a little bit slower, a little more caution, take a little longer to make judgments and decisions. But nevertheless, it, it has that level of impact for me. Um, all right, so let's add to this then some of the other things that occur when snow removal um, doesn't happen. So uh, I'm fortunate where I live in my apartment complex that they really get out there and they move that snow quickly. They have, they're contracted with someone to do it and they get out there and they clean off our parking lot and they clean our sidewalks and there, we're also fortunate to have enough uh, extra ground area uh, on the premises where they can pile that snow um, and so it doesn't block any of the ways to get around our apartment building. So um, it's pretty easy. I'm, I'm pretty assured when I go out after a snow that I'm going to be able to navigate around the grounds of my apartment, apartment complex. However, once I leave those grounds and start to venture out onto the public sidewalks, uh, and streets, then uh, it, it's a little bit different story uh, out there. So one of the streets that's close to me is a secondary road, um, and so you know they don't get cleaned first, and uh, those sidewalks don't get cleaned first. And so often what I'm dealing with is that maybe a pathway that has only been cleaned for a single file walking. So I'm kind of trying to walk behind my dog, which is not a real, real easy or effective thing to do. Um, the, uh, uh, another option is that it hasn't been cleaned at all, so I'm kind of trying to wade through the snow and, and not, uh, again, lose my cues and wander into the street. Um, the other sidewalk uh, that runs along the other side of my complex, though, is, uh, is, a, is a major street, and so they do get out and clean it. Um, but um, sometimes the, um, the, when the street is cleared, um, it gets pushed onto the sidewalk, uh, which makes it impassable. Um, and then I have to try to walk into the street. And then sometimes within the street, you know, there's uh, snow and, and some ice that uh, still kind of falls back out into the street or it refreezes overnight, uh, that kind of thing. And so it's slippery and dangerous. And the only thing I can think of that's more dangerous than walking in the street in traffic is falling down in the street in traffic. Uh, so that makes it a very unsafe uh, situation and one that uh, difficult for me to maneuver. Um, another thing that happens uh, is that um, sometimes the snow uh, uh, may be cleared from the bus stop itself, but they pile it into the first lane. So like there's a turning lane and they may pile it into that first lane of traffic and the bus stops out into the second, in the second lane because they can't actually get to the curb. And so I'm having to kind of climb over uh, the snow between the bus stop and the bus in order to get to the bus. And I can assure you that's not a pretty sight. Uh, very slippy and slidey and, uh, and a very unsafe thing for, for me to be doing. And then, of course, there's, there's the issue of snow being piled up so that it blocks the crosswalk areas or the curb ramps um, that are at the corners of the street. But before I can really talk about um, the, what the snow does to impact that, I need to talk a little bit about uh, what, it, what I do when I cross streets to begin with. And I'm not going to go into great detail here, but I want to give you just a brief um, uh, uh, overview of, of, the, of the types of skills and cues I use for crossing streets. So as I'm approaching uh, a street, uh, so I'm still on the sidewalk walking down towards the, the street crossing, I'm already paying attention to the sound of the traffic that's going both parallel with me and that's on the street in front of me where I plan to cross. I'm already listening, trying to judge which one's in motion, um, how long it's been stopped, if it stops, those kinds of things. So I'm already kind of paying attention to uh, the flow of traffic as I, as, I get, as I walk towards the street corner. Um, as I start to get closer to it, then I start paying a little bit more attention to uh, cues that I might feel under my feet as well. So I'm paying attention to the sidewalk. It starts to slope a little bit if there's a curb ramp. So I'm, I'm kind of feeling for with my feet for that. Um, there may be a um, detectable warning strip at the edge. I'm paying attention to that. There may be street furniture. So like maybe there's a trash can at that street corner, that sort of thing. And I'm kind of paying attention for the sound cues that bounce off of that, <coughs> as well as the sound of the traffic as well. So all of these things kind of help me 
uh, know where I am. So if, if it's a familiar street crossing, then there's kind of this checklist in my head that I'm going through trying to make sure that when I approach that street corner, I'm going to be uh, lined up for crossing. <coughs> So the next point I want to make is that the, the, for people who are blind or visually impaired, um, the approach or the lining up, the alignment for crossing the street is critical. So a correct alignment means that I'm uh, likely to uh, cross straight in the direction that I want to cross and end up where I want to be. If I'm not lined up correctly, then it can mean that I might wander into traffic uh, or walk too close or, or even uh, into it a little bit. It may mean that I'm walking off in the opposite direction, so I'm not really walking into traffic, but I may be walking up towards the stopped cars on the street that I'm crossing. Um, either option can mean that I end up in the wrong place once I get to the other side of the street. Um, and again, it doesn't take a, a great deal of, um, of being off, off the mark. Uh, in order for me to, uh, to be disoriented once I'm in, on the other side of the street. So I don't have to be that far from the mark I was trying to hit when I cross the street in order to uh, be unsure as if I keep walking forward, if, I, if I'm on the path that I want to be on, or what kind of adjustment I may need to, um, to be on when I'm uh, uh, crossing the street. Um, so these are uh, a number of things that, uh, that can happen when I'm trying to judge a street crossing. So uh, I want to uh, let you know that there's a piece on this that's on a, on a video done for a Human Factors workshop at one of the uh, TRB uh, uh, conferences, annual meetings a couple of years ago. Um, and so I've given you, uh, all you have on the slides there, uh, a website uh, where you can go and uh, look at um, uh, this video. It's, it's called uh, Perils for Pedestrians, and it shows a little bit more about how I walk both with the cane and with the dog and how I navigate uh, different types of street crossings and those sorts of things. Nothing, no, no snow involved in this picture for me, but in this video for me, but it does show a little bit more about how uh, people who are blind or visually impaired travel, and I talk about it a bit more there. <coughs> So that's how I typically uh, try to cross the street. And so let's see what happens when there's snow piled up on the corner. So if I'm, if, if all about crossing the, if, if crossing the street correctly for me, accurately and safely for me, is all about how I approach the corner and how I'm lined up at the corner for crossing, that if the corner is covered over with snow, I'm automatically off my game. It automatically means that there's something that's preventing me from doing this the way I normally do it, and so therefore I'm going to have to uh, compensate for that in some way. So uh, one of the things that might happen is that I may have to actually step out into the street to get around the corner in order to be able to uh, line up again to cross. And we've already talked about how uh, that can be dangerous being in the street, but it also means that I'm lining up in the street on the other side of the snow pile, and I don't have any of my cues for lining up. At that, that point, I'm pretty much depending on what I remember about the feel of the street under my feet and listening to the traffic uh, moving along in order to be able to, um, to line up. The other thing that I might do is wander away from the street corner down farther down the sidewalk where it may be clear so that I'm uh, farther away from the actual intersection when I make my cross. Um, again, this may mean that I'm crossing and I may have to uh, veer between some cars that are waiting there for the light to change, uh, which puts me off, a, off an even uh, course. And it may also mean that when I get to the other side of the street that I'm not anywhere near where I normally would be when I cross the street. So then I have to try to figure out um, navigating back to the point that I want to be at uh, and doing that in and around um, all of the things that may be there as well, like the, the snow being piled up and those sorts of things. Um, so as you can tell, um, this sort of thing makes it very unlikely that, uh, that I, can, I can have a great level of, of, of assurance about my orientation when I'm traveling. And so when it snows and I'm trying to get out and travel under these kinds of conditions, I really have to stop and assess 
what it is I'm getting out for. Is it worth the uh, the extra effort, the extra stress of getting out and doing that? Um, is that something that uh, that I need to be doing, um, uh, and, and sometimes it's a critical enough situation that, in fact, uh, you know, I do need to be out and doing it, and I do have to take that risk. Um, and I certainly understand as I'm doing it that I'm that I'm definitely taking a risk about my own safety in order to be able to get out and do what I need to do. So all of the conditions I've also mentioned can cause uh, problems and do cause uh, problems and challenges for people traveling uh, independently if they have other types of disabilities as well. So for people who have issues of balance uh, or gait challenges, um, they're certainly going to find it difficult to walk in the snow uh, and, and, and negotiate icy patches. Um, having to negotiate piles of snow, uh, those kinds of things are certainly going to be a problem. And I certainly have some personal understanding of that uh, as well, and that I have some issues that, that cause balance to be an, a problem. And so I'm just not as uh, steady on my feet as I used to be. And, and so uh, stepping on uh, snow and ice uh, can certainly make that much more treacherous. Um, people with intellectual disabilities often rely on traveling a known path. Um, they're looking for real specific cues that they identify, um, and they're used to walking. Uh, they learn to walk a path in a particular way. And so again, just like the snow puts me off my path, uh, the snow can put, um, it can make that path look different, uh, and it can also put people with intellectual disabilities off of their path. So they don't see the landmarks they're used to, the corners, the street corners don't look the same, that sort of thing. And so they, that can cause some disorientation as well. And then as we've seen in some of our pictures, people who use wheelchairs or other mobility devices um, certainly need a clear path of travel um, in order to be able to uh, negotiate uh, where they need to go. And it needs to be wide enough uh, for them to be able to uh, get through it safely. And then certainly they need those curb ramps cleared off um, so that they can get through. So while I'm talking about what I do to try to walk around snow piles that are on the curb ramp, uh, for a person using a mobility device, uh, getting around those piles uh, and, and uh, uh, making one of those other choices about how to cross the street is not even an option because they need the curb ramp in the first place. All right. Um, so I want to. There's some. Uh, there's some other videos that uh, you can see. Uh, again, this is on the. Um, Perils for Pedestrians uh, uh, video site. Um, we give you the number of the video here, and they'll show. Uh, uh, let's see. One of these shows how uh, a person. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It's an interview with the person who uses a wheelchair, and uh, some of the things that she encounters uh, when the snow is uh, is uh, keeping her from being able to go where she needs to go. And so she talks about that uh, very clearly. Um, I just these are the, the John Z. Wetmore is the person who uh, is uh, responsible for perils for pedestrians and making these videos and conducting the interviews. Um, he certainly knows his stuff. Uh, he, and, and these these uh, the perils that he uh, shows the videos that he puts up um, are uh, uh, basically taken from television shows that he does can do. And uh, he, he looks at how these situations uh, occur for all people with and without disabilities. So I want to recognize his work and thank him for all that he's doing to uh, bring to the attention of the public um, um, some of the challenges that uh, pedestrians have um, in traveling. So I just want to make a few comments in, in uh, summary here. Uh, while pathways um, that are blocked uh, or made treacherous by uh, inadequate snow removal um, practices are really a problem for any pedestrian, anybody out trying to navigate the world. For people with disabilities who rely on public transportation and being able to uh, use w uh, pathways to get uh, to where they need to go, um, it's really uh, has a greater impact, um, and it, it it takes away that accessibility. I don't have the option of choosing to take my car into work because the street is clean um, when I, you know when when uh, it's difficult to walk or use public transit. I I, I need to use public transit. Um, so in places where snow happens quite a lot, 
uh, I'm sorry, where snow happens infrequently, um, you know, then this can be considered to be kind of an inconvenient sort of thing that happens. Um, I grew up in Mississippi, and so when it snows there, pretty much everything shuts down anyway, and so it's just kind of a you know quiet day or two, and it doesn't last very long. So, you know, in those situations, um, you know, there's um, it, it, you know that kind of puts a different light on it. But where it snows a lot, and we have a lot of places in our country where it does snow quite a bit. Um, then it really starts to become an access issue, and it really does have an impact on a person's health and their economic status and employment, education, quality of life, any of a number of things. It, it uh, uh, truly does have an impact on. So I think it's really clear that we do need to develop some better policies and practices to address snow removal so that all of the hard work and the, um, the cost that our cities and counties and places of business um, uh, all of the money that they put into snow removal uh, will will really be affected when it comes to uh, clearing their pathways. And we do put a lot of money uh, into into snow removal. All of those plows that you see out there, and all of those people dropping chemicals to uh, help keep it from being so slippery. Those kinds of things all cost money. And so we want to make sure that our policies are such that those uh, those efforts and the and the money that's being spent. Uh, includes creating access for people with disabilities. And so our next speaker is going to talk uh, about these kinds of policies and practices uh, a lot more than I am. And so it's my pleasure now to turn the program over to Roger Millar. Roger? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Roger Millar. I'm the Vice President of Smart Growth America. And what I wanted to do today was give you an overview of, of Complete Streets and snow management, talk a little bit about Smart Growth, uh, talk about Complete Streets. Uh, at Smart Growth America, one of my functions, I'm the director of the National Complete Streets Coalition. Uh, talk a little bit about snow management, um, and then just the state of the practice and some case studies from around the country. And you can see here a picture of my little boy in my backyard mm -hmm. to give you a sense of uh, Know, the snow that I'm used to and uh, some of the stuff that, that I've done in the snow management area. Um, smart growth, we like to define it anytime we make a presentation. To us, it means building urban, suburban, and rural communities with housing and transportation choices that are near job shops and schools. Um, strategies like this are designed to support thriving local economies and protect the environment. Uh, so a walkable urban space is, uh, is important in that concept. Um, I hear a lot about smart growth as I, I go around the country, as I go around the world. I hear that it's ugly, um, and actually it's not. I hear that we have no history with it in North America, and actually we do. I hear that no one would want to live there, like this smart growth community, Aspen, Colorado. Um, I hear it just doesn't work here, like the Pearl District that we built in Portland, Oregon, on an abandoned railroad yard. So uh, shut up and drive. You know the uh, the state of our public rights of way is inevitable. Uh, they're there for the automobile and uh, always have been and always will be. But we all know that the way we design and build our communities has enormous consequences. So looking at complete streets and the idea of complete streets, we uh, as Americans and American communities, we know how to build these things right. We have a, a track record of having done that. And yet we build roads that turn out like this, or like this. When you look at this slide, you see the side here that says the sign that says caution deaf and blind children. And what we basically created for them is a very dangerous situation. Or we build things like this, uh, transportation that just doesn't work, transit facilities that don't work for all of the people that have the right to, to use them. So the, the solution to these problems, uh, you know, being the director of the National Complete Streets Pol uh, Coalition, you'd be surprised to hear that I think Complete Streets policies are a solution. Um, anyway, Complete Streets policies, the idea behind a Complete Streets policy is, is to ensure that the entire right-of-way is planned and designed and operated and maintained to provide safe access for all users. That's Complete Streets in a nutshell. There are many types of Complete Streets. From the most urban situation, like uh, where I am here in Chicago as the fire trucks go by, hopefully you, you don't hear them too loudly in the background, uh, to the most rural situations in the country, um, a complete streets policy applies or can apply to them all. Um, we're seeing complete streets policies adopted all over the country. Uh, this year we celebrated our 500th complete street policy, 
and right after that our 550th complete street policy and they're being adopted in all types of communities. It's interesting that most of the communities, the majority of communities that have adopted complete streets policies are small towns, rural places, and, and small suburban communities. So large cities and mid-sized cities, less than 20% of the total. Complete streets policies are being adopted all around the country. We have 27 states now that have complete streets policies in place. What complete streets policies can do is uh, develop a street system that benefits communities. It improves safety. It provides people with transportation choices, back to the smart growth angle. Uh, better health. It supports economic development, reduces costs, manages congestion, conserves resources. What complete streets are, it, it, it's a policy approach. What we're talking about when we, we talk about a complete streets policy being implemented is that a community changes the everyday decision-making processes and systems that they use as they make investments in constructing or maintaining or uh, repairing uh, their transportation systems. And it really is about long-term changes to the built environment. But complete streets aren't. There is no such thing as a, you know, a complete street. You know, my, my town built a complete street. We can check that one off the box. We're done. It's not a design prescription. It's not a specific way to build a street. The sidewalk must be here and the bike lane must be here. It's not a mandate to go out and spend a ton of money immediately retrofitting everything that you've got. And last but certainly not the, the least important, complete streets are not a panacea. There are other issues that you need to address in your communities that complete streets aren't going to take care of. So a, a lot of people talk about funding in Complete Streets, you know, we don't have the money to do this. What Complete Streets is about is about using existing resources, the money that you have in hand today, in a different way. Uh, while it's important to retrofit streets over time, you don't need to do it to get started, and you really don't need additional funding to make Complete Streets happen in your community. So it's, it's about thinking ahead and thinking smart. It's about saving money through things like narrower lanes and more options, and it's about doing it right the first time. You know, when you build a facility. There's a lot of energy uh, that goes into it. And as uh, Dr. Mark Nicholson in, in Billings said, you know, if, if we think we don't have the time and money to do it right, what makes you think we have the time and money to do it over? Um, it's just, it's good business. There are lots of Complete Streets resources out there. Obviously, Smart Growth America, if you go to our website, smartgrowthamerica.org, and click on the Complete Streets program, we've got everything you'd ever want to know about the Complete Streets, um, developing policies, implementing policies, and uh, you know, sign up and get on our mailing list and you'll get regular information on a, on a regular basis. So let's talk about snow management and how that relates uh, to Complete Streets. Um, the purpose of snow management is to provide people with access. And when we talk about Complete Streets, we're talking about safe and, you know, uh, safe and convenient access for all modes. So ac access is important, safety is important. It's also about economic vitality and quality of life. If you live in a community that, that regularly deals with snow, it's about keeping your economy going uh, while the storms are happening and after the storms are over. It's about maintaining the quality of life in your community as, as people live there or people visit there or people do business there. It's, it's an important part of the, the business of local and state government in snowy communities. It's also an important part uh, of the business of communities that maybe don't see snow quite as often. Uh, the goal is to get the snow out of the way, um, store it, dispose of it, you know, and uh, maintain the facilities that have been covered with snow in a safe condition over time. We use a lot of tools to manage snow. We use machines. You know, you're used to the seeing the big uh, DOT road uh, plow go by um, in pedestrian situations, urban situations, that's usually not what you're going to wind up using. But there are machines. There are tools. Uh, you use a, a lot of rock, um, depending on where you're at. You might use a lot of chemicals, salt and other chemical de-icers. And it has a lot to do about people, because snow management is labor intensive. The typical approach, and it, 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 this isn't rocket science managing snow. You get the snow out of the way. Um, the most affordable thing to do is to store it nearby until it melts. Um, if it's impractical to store it nearby, you move it if you have to. And then you're not done when the snowstorm's over because uh, snow is going to melt and then it's going to get cold again. It's going to turn to ice. You know, things happen. 
So you need to manage ice and, and snow with, with, again, more labor and with rock and sand and chemicals and things like that over time. With pedestrian facilities, we, the, the typical approach that local governments make to pedestrian facilities is to put that burden on the adjacent property owner. The typical state approach, what most state highway departments do, is when they come to a town and there are pedestrian facilities, they put that burden on the local government, and local government usually turns right around and puts that burden on adjacent property owners, although there are exceptions to that rule. But that's typically how it happens. In commercial areas, what's happened over time in, in snow country is that the, uh, the, the property owners have banded together, either through contracts or through business associations and the like, and, and taking care of it that way. Usually the city, town, county, whoever is responsible for public spaces like pedestrian facilities in parks and pedestrian facilities at public buildings and the like. And what happens in residential areas is, is quite often it's, you, know, you see your neighbors out there plowing your shovel and cell on the sidewalk uh, first thing in the morning after the snowstorm. Uh, there are issues with snow management for pedestrian facilities. A huge issue is inconsistency. And I don't know whether you can see the slide not well or not, but someone spray painted on the uh, snow in, in Billings, Montana. I am too lazy to shovel, which I, I think is hysterical. But um, there's inconsistency that happens where I, I shovel my walk and my neighbor doesn't. Um, one business shovels its walk and the, and, and the next one down the street doesn't. And we're talking about linear facilities in an environment where, you know, I don't care who owns it. I need to get from A to B uh, walking or however I'm, I'm getting down the sidewalk. Uh, there's something I call a hot potato where the, uh, the, the DOT comes through and plows the snow onto the sidewalk and then the property owner shovels it back out into the street. And then uh, the Public Works Department comes back and shovels in and pushes it back onto the sidewalk and back onto the street and sidewalk street. So, you, know, and you wind up with this kind of no man's land right along the curb line um, where a, a bunch of snow that's been moved a bunch of times winds up staying. And, and what that results in is a lack of access. It's a, it's a huge issue, uh, particularly at street corners, um, at, uh, at driveways, uh, where people, because they've moved the snow to accommodate the automobile, they move the snow in a place that makes it a burden on, on the rest of us. So the state of the practice in snow management, again, it's, it's not rocket science. It's, it, it really is about management techniques. It's about creating partnerships. It's about developing policy and enforcing policies and legislation. You know, the partnerships might be partnerships between the public sector and the private sector. It might be partnerships between uh, different private sector actors. It might be partnerships between not-for-profits and the business community. Um, the people that are doing this right are, are doing it together. Uh, they're putting policies and legislation in place, and they're enforcing those policies. In a lot of situations, what is successful is the private associations. And in, in business communities in particular, you see a lot of success in snow management where the, the private groups have organized to make it happen. And community groups make it happen too. There are community groups in communities around the country who, who go out and shovel the snow for the, the senior citizen who might be not too lazy to shovel snow, but just physically incapable of shoveling snow on their property. So, those are the kinds of things we see in the state of the practice. There is no silver bullet snow management machine that you can buy uh, online and bring to your community and, and make things all better. So let's talk about some case studies. I've uh, had some experience in snow country, and I've talked to some friends who have some experience in snow country. This doesn't, by any stretch, cover the, 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 the breadth of the issue in uh, the United States and North America, but it's a, it's a good place to maybe learn some lessons. We'll start with Aspen, Colorado. Um, you heard from my colleague from there. He had to leave and, and go deal with the snow, but Aspen does a, a pretty good job of it. Um, Aspen's a town of uh, you know, roughly 6,000 people, about 8,000 feet up in the mountains in uh, central Colorado. Their average snowfall is about 152 inches a year. When they plow streets, they prioritize that plowing by traffic volume and public safety. They're looking at bus routes and emergency routes and schools first. Um, and uh, the streets in the city, whether they're state highways or not, <coughs> excuse me, are maintained by the city under contract with the state Depart highway department. Um, what happens in residential areas in Aspen is typical in most communities. They plow the snow to the curb, and that's where it sits. 
in the central business district and on the highway, they plow the snow to the center of the road and then they come back and pick it up and truck it away, which is, is an expensive thing to do, but necessary given the volume of snow that they have. Their city code requires that sidewalks be clear within 24 hours of a storm, and they do a pretty good job of, uh, of enforcing that, and that enforcement is by the police department uh, with the parks department clearing public walks. And, and something that they do that I think is a, a great approach to that hot potato issue is the streets department plows the, the streets early in the morning. Uh, the business community comes out and clears their walks off, and they put it on the street. And then the streets department comes back later and makes a second pass to clear the snow that's been shoveled into the street off and, and get it out of the way. So what Aspen has done is recognize that they're not done with that first pass. They have to come back and uh, deal with the snow that people put in the road. You know, you can make it against the rules to shovel the snow into the road, and you know, every afternoon, you know, every morning after snowstorm, that's where you're going to find it regardless. Another community that does a, a great job with this is Crested Butte, Colorado, another mountain town, another resort community. Crested Butte gets about 200 inches of snow a year. They do something that I think is really cool and that they they have a snow and ice control plan that they adopt every year. They, they Every year in the fall, they have a summit with their stakeholders to talk about what has worked in the past and what has not worked in the past. And so there's an annual revisit and refresh of their snow and ice control plan. It isn't an ordinance the council adopted 20 years ago and we just kind of go out and do business as usual. They have a conversation in the community about how to do it right. Um, the public works department is responsible for everything in the street. Um, like Aspen, the city and the county maintain the state highway uh, through town. Uh, the parks department clears sidewalks in the CBD and in public areas. So here's a case where it isn't the business owners cleaning the sidewalk. It is parks coming up and, and doing it. And they use, rather than, than shovels and, and the like, they use uh, skid steer blowers, uh, basically you know, your bobcat with a, a brush on the front or a blower on the front. Um, they stay out of high traffic areas during periods of high use. Uh, they do, once they remove the snow, require business owners to keep the sidewalk clear afterwards. And they were um, honest enough to admit that compliance and enforcement can be uneven. McCall, Idaho is uh, where I have a house, where I used to live, where I used to be public works director. Here's myself and, and my two kids in the snow. Um, about 140 inches of snow a year. Uh, public works department is responsible for streets and bus stops, emergency routes, et cetera. Um, like the communities in Colorado, we maintain the state highway. In the central business district, we picked all the snow up on the street with uh, big loaders, and we had two central snow dumps in the, in the downtown where we put the snow until it melted in the spring. Everywhere else, we basically pushed it to the side of the road, and there it sat. And in most of the call, there weren't any sidewalks, so uh, what people were doing was, was walking along uh, the side of the road. Um, the Parks Department takes care of parks and public areas. Um, the Parks Department does because it's a recreational community. There are some paths that they may leave snow on, uh, for cross-country skiers and, and snowshoers and the like. The city code requires property owners to clear sidewalks. Um, compliance and enforcement is pretty uneven, um, although for the most part, the business community understands if there's snow and ice there, um, people aren't going to get to my door. And if somebody falls out, I'm going to get sued. So they take care of it. But what can happen and, and, and ruin a person's whole day is if there's a vacant building where you don't have a, a, a business owner paying attention, there might be a part of the block that gets, gets blocked with snow and ice, and, and that can be a problem. Um, the city does have the authority in its language, um, <clears throat> its code language, to clear the walk, and if, if need be, assess property owners the cost of that. And again, in McCall, outside of the central business district, there are very few sidewalks, and, and people are walking along the side of the road. Boulder, Colorado is a, a more urban place than the resort towns that I've been talking about. Um, Right outside of Denver, their average snowfall is around 83 inches. And talking with the folks in Boulder, their public works department, like most places, is responsible for the streets. Um, they take care of the state highways. In the central business district, there's the downtown Boulder business district. And you know the city has made adjacent property owners responsible for snow removal. They banded together in the central Boulder, downtown Boulder business district. They take care of moving the snow. And the people who are members of that district pay the cost of that. 
uh, parks and, and public spaces are cleaned up by public works in the department. Um, the code in Boulder requires property owners to clear the sidewalk, and I understand from staff there that the police department is, is pretty good about enforcing the snow policy. Marquette, Michigan is a, another uh, community in snow country that I've had the pleasure to do a little work in recently, and I talked with the people in planning and public works there about uh, their snow routes and what they do. Here's a map of Marquette with the uh, places that they, they plow. The red are sidewalks plowed by the city, and the blue are sidewalks plowed by the Downtown Development Association. Marquette, up on the shores of Lake Superior, gets about 150 inches of snow a year. Uh, most of that blowing in sideways from my experience up there. Um, the snow management policy was created by the Public Works Department. It's not in law, it's a, it's a policy. Um, and that Public Works Department is responsible for streets and emergency routes. Um, like everywhere else, the state highway signed an agreement to let the city and the county take care of the snow. Um, it's stored on site when it's moved and it's only picked up when it's needed. Uh, the city takes care of about 67 miles, well, I'm sorry, there are 67 miles of sidewalk in the city, and the city maintains about 20 miles of that sidewalk for access during, uh, during the snow, and uh, that 20 miles is primarily uh, prioritized all, along routes to schools. And then the Downtown Development Authority is taking care of the sidewalks in the CBD. Now, like just about every place else, the code requires property owners, not, not citywide, but in designated districts to clear the sidewalk, uh, but the folks in Marquette acknowledge that the, the code is generally not enforced, and that's because nobody likes to have uh, angry neighbors calling um, elected officials or the city manager and saying that they're, you know, they're being mean to me about this, uh, this enforcement thing. So uh, we don't see a lot of that happening. So that is uh, the presentation. I'm going to turn it back over to uh, to Christy, and we'll be available to answer questions. All right. Thank you so much, Roger, uh, and, and Donna, and, and Russ, even though he's on the phone. A great presentation. Um, we do want to uh, take questions from the audience. So what I'm going to do right now is ask Stephanie to come back on and give instructions on how you can ask your questions. At this time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star then the number one on your telephone keypad. Again, that is star then the number one to ask a question. Your first question comes from a line of Jana in DC. Uh, hi there, uh, Roger. Great presentation. Thank you. Uh, this is Jana in DC, and I, I guess I have a question for climates that don't see snow regularly like uh, Arlington, Virginia, where I live, we might see a big snowstorm every you know, two or three years with smaller snowstorms in between. The biggest problem was mentioned by speakers today that the principal arterials with the sidewalks that are very adjacent to the, the main road, the snow gets plowed onto those sidewalks. And as a property owner who um, lives along one of those sidewalks in a residential area, it becomes impossible in a big snowstorm for me to actually get out there and shovel it. I just don't have the, the muscle strength. It gets compact and ice builds up and then it's impassable to pedestrians. And there are quite a few on my street. So I didn't hear a lot of solutions to that particular predicament. I heard, well, some cities in the central business district plow to the center and then pick up but that's expensive. Um, I've suggested to the county, well, instead of plowing all four lanes, plow two lanes so that it doesn't get shoveled onto the sidewalk. What's, what's best practices and who's dealing with this effectively? That's a, a really good question. And I, I think the, the answer in general is that people who deal with it all the time are in a better position. And you know, you make a decision as a community, do we make that responsibility the responsibility of the property owners and enforce the heck out of it? Or do we make that a government service that's provided for the taxpayer's dollar and, and tax the adjacent owners uh, appropriately? Um, and in a, a situation like Arlington, and I, I, I grew up in the southeast, and I know, you know when there's that big snowstorm or that big ice storm, it happens maybe once every couple of years. And when it does, everybody shuts down. Um, I think the, the notion where snow is a relatively infrequent event 
using a, a management technique where you're you're looking at identifying the people who have mobility challenges and need help and and having a, a program that's specific to managing you know manage it as an incident um, is kind of where the state of the practice is going. That's even happening in some communities that see snow more often. I know uh, Mayor Engen in Missoula, Montana, a friend of mine, um, has a a hotline where seniors and others can can call in and the city will help them with removing snow from their property if they can't get that done or, or getting around if they can't get around in the particular situation. But I think it's just a, a matter of this rising to a level of importance in the community that it gets addressed either through um, consistent enforcement or through uh, the public sector taking it over and either doing it itself or, or, or contracting it out to get done. You know, if you've got a uh, sidewalk that's along a principal arterial that gets used by a lot of people, is it appropriate to put that burden on the owner of the adjacent property or is it more appropriate to put that burden on the community as a whole? Those are questions that need to be worked out, you know, town by town. There is no single prescription for it, but the, the options are out there. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you for your question, Jana. Um, do we have another question, Stephanie? Your next question comes from Kristen in Minnesota. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to ask, um, I come from a very rural, uh, very uh, um, sparsely populated county, and some people would call us a frontier community, and we've had a really hard time identifying um, model communities with, um, that, that are addressing complete streets, smart growth, these snow removal type of issues. Um, we don't have really a major population center. And I just was wondering if you had any resources or if you could um, suggest any model communities. Um, you know, we have like 5,000 people in our entire county and the biggest city within there has 1,300 people. Um, but we're really interested and these type of issues, just having a hard time looking for comparable type communities. No, I, I, it's, a, it's a, a great, great question, a great statement, and that's something that, that we're working on. Um, one of the things that Smart Growth America is looking at doing through the National Complete Streets Coalition is convening a summit um, to talk about these uh, you know, snow issues in snow country. Um, and we're thinking that's going to happen. I, I wish I could just announce that it's happening today, but we're hoping it's going to happen early in 2015. Um, what I would look at in terms of, uh, of best practices absent that opportunity to have that discussion is look at what happens in, um, in small resort communities. Look at what happens uh, on small university campuses, college campuses. Um, you know, McCall, Idaho, where I live before I, I moved to my, my present location, that's a town of 2,500 people in a county of 7,000. And there is a ski mountain there, but it's, it's not Aspen, and, and the community was not rich. But we, we managed the snow as best we could, and, uh, you know, that might be a place to look at. Uh, there might be other places in, in Minnesota to look at. And what we're hoping to do in the next couple of years is put together the, the exactly the resource that you're asking for. I, it, to the best of my knowledge, it doesn't exist. All right. Thank you for your uh, question, Kristen. Um, our next question. Your next question comes from Michael in Maryland. Hi. Right, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. I'd like to follow up with the first caller's question. Um, in situations where snowplow drivers um, quickly remove the snow from the roadways and dump them on the sidewalks, and it gets to be a greater burden from the adjacent property owners than the snow that was that just fell naturally, does anyone know of any policies that would require the the um, plow operators to return after they've gotten the roadways cleared to remove the snow that they have dumped? on the sidewalks. <laughs> That's that hot potato thing I was talking about. It's a great question. And you know, frankly, that's why in most of the communities that I talked about, the city has reached an agreement with the DOT because what, what the DOT is used to doing is keeping long, long mileage of roads open. And they use big trucks with big plows in the blade points one direction 
and they move a lot of snow. And where they're happiest is where they're out going 50 miles an hour pushing snow off the highway. It's just not a real appropriate uh, technique when you get into town. And so the towns take that over for a couple reasons. One, they're using smaller equipment and maybe more sophisticated equipment. And two, they're more responsive to that angry property owner. Um, you know, there, there's a, a city council member or a mayor or somebody that you can call to uh, get your issue resolved. Um, and different places do it different ways. You know, like I said with, with the folks in Aspen, in the CBD, they plow to the middle. And in, in not all over town, but in parts of town, they plow to the middle. And on a snow day, you know that that four-lane road is going to be a two-lane road with a big pile of snow in the middle, or the two-lane road is going to be a two-lane road with a big pile of snow in the middle, and, and, and cars kind of um, make their way by it as best they can. And then they come in and pick it up. And that costs money, but that community is determined that it's in their best interest to spend the money for that kind of a solution. You know, the other thing that Aspen does that's kind of neat is uh, they will plow the streets, and then when the people that are, are shoveling their walks shovel the snow to the street, they come by and pick it up later. Um, but that that hot potato thing with, you know, that, that driver plowing the snow onto the sidewalk, which the city has made the removal of the snow from the sidewalk, the property owner's responsibility. Uh, the property owner, you know, one, they're moving more snow, and two, where they're moving, they're moving it back to the street. That's an issue that we haven't addressed very well, and uh, we're hoping that over over time, as we explore this further, we come up with some better ideas. So this is Donna. I just want to add to Roger's comments to say that, you know, when we started out this session today, we were talking about how. Uh, developing these policies and practices around what's most effective in snow removal so that uh, the pedestrians uh, and people with disabilities aren't uh, just uh, taken out of the equation. Uh, all this is fairly new in terms of trying to find solutions to it. And so while Roger was able to point to uh, some places who have made some real effort in this area, I think what is still needed in most places, um, such as Arlington County and, and wherever you may live, is to uh, uh, get a dialogue going uh, with the city or county uh, officials, whoever is the most appropriate uh, in terms of the public uh, part of the discussion, the involve the, the, the local transportation uh, providers in the discussion and get your community uh, voices heard um, and start saying, you know, this is on the table for discussion. You know, the way it's been done for years and years and years is no longer effective. We have more and more pedestrians, more and more cyclists, more and more people with disabilities out and about trying to do what we need to do. And so this practice that, that has been uh, typical it no longer works for us as a community. And to get that discussion going about, so what are some other things that can happen? And the more that, that this is done, the more different solutions can be derived. And then we'll be able to share them around so that uh, folks will have more uh, policies and practices to choose from in determining what's going to be most effective for their area. But it's brand new, really, in, in a, you know, it sounds funny to say that because it's been snowing forever, of course, but in terms of well, the impact on pedestrians and really starting to take some steps to, uh, to fix that and, and make it um, less a burden for pedestrians um, is, is a relatively new thing. And so I think uh, uh, getting that discussion going in your community is the best thing that we can do if, if there's not a current policy that's, that's working for you right now. Yeah, this is, uh, this is Roger. I wanted to add something uh, that I didn't talk about before. Um, I, I really applaud the way Crested Butte handles this. You know, they've been moving snow up there for close to 125 years. But every fall, they sit down and have a community conversation about what's working and what's not working. It's, it's not, you know, most of us have a law that's been on the books in town forever, and they go out and they plow the snow, and the only time people talk about it is when they're yelling about what's happening during the event itself. And to do what Crested Butte does and say, okay, we know it's going to snow. We know how we've done it before. How can we make it better? And having that conversation and inviting you know the business community and, and, and other members of the community in to participate in that conversation is a I think a, a, a practice that other communities could emulate. All right, thank you, Michael, for that question. Um, I believe we have a chat section question. We're going to take next. 
Yes, we do. Um, here's one that came in on the chat, and I believe it's directed towards Roger. Uh, even if the city comes by a second time after the property owner has cleared their sidewalk, uh, how do they avoid blocking any pedestrian ramps on corners, so, so curb ramps, for example? Yeah, that's that's a huge issue, um, particularly for people that are, are, are mobility impaired. And the the curb ramps, one of the things that, you know, people who live on that corner don't necessarily feel ownership of, of the corner. They feel ownership of the of the frontage, uh, you know, along the straight piece of curb. But when it starts to curb around, they consider it the city's responsibility. Um, I know in, in Aspen and when I was working in McCall, we put a lot of energy into keeping that area clear. Um, we put a lot of energy into it because we heard from the community that cares about that. And um, I, I think what happens when it's when it's not being addressed proactively by the community in question, um, then people need to to make some noise, and and that's how it gets taken care of. Um, the maintaining the way across the public street for pedestrians is a responsibility that. I don't think the city can get rid of by just saying it's the responsibility of the adjacent property owners if they're not enforcing that um, appropriately or taking care of it themselves. And this is Donna. I would just add to that that Roger is absolutely right. That walkway that's under the jurisdiction of the public entity um, uh, is required to be maintained and, and kept accessible for people with disabilities. So when you have that curb ramp that goes out into the street for uh, pedestrian crossings, and there's a pedestrian crosswalk there, et cetera, et cetera, um, that is a, a, a circulation path in, for for uh, pedestrians. And so one of the issues that the FHWA uh, questions and answers piece uh, that I referenced early on, the, one of the things that it covers is the fact that under the ADA, uh, public entities are required to uh, to keep those um, uh, to maintain the accessibility of those uh, pedestrian pathways. So, you know, you can bring that to the table for your discussion as well. All right. Thank you for that question. Um, I, I see that we have a couple more questions uh, waiting on the phone. We, we have time for those. Um, but I will remind you, if you want to ask a question over the phone, you press star 1 on your phone uh, and you'll be put in the queue. But Stephanie, if you could announce our next question. Your next question comes from Anne in Virginia. Hi, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, this has been very interesting. Uh, one of the things that um, I've heard about here in Fairfax County, Virginia, is that in previous years, people have tried to get a uh, county code that you, you have to shovel your sidewalks. And what they found is that uh, they get a group of senior citizens to fight this, and so it has never Pass because the seniors are saying, well, we can't shovel our sidewalk, so you shouldn't require this. And I think a lot of it is that many people are drivers and they don't really think about the people who aren't drivers and that um, these people who aren't drivers need to walk on the sidewalks and use pedestrian travel to get to public transportation. So how do you uh, kind of work with this group of people who say, no, we don't want this? Um, this is Donna. I'll take a stab at that first, if you like. Um, it's a difficult issue when you have uh, uh, separate populations within a, a given community that are arguing opposite sides uh, of, a, of a solution. Um, and so I think that uh, what needs to be brought uh, to the table for a discussion there is, so maybe it's true that senior citizens um, uh, do have difficulty shoveling the sidewalks in front of their properties. And so what are some alternatives for that? One of the things that the, um, the, the brief we developed addresses, and Roger certainly covered this nicely in his presentation, is the um, use of partnerships to make things happen. So I know that in some cases, um, you know, there, there are places where um, uh, you know, volunteers or uh, community volunteers are part of the solution in terms of shoveling for people who can't do it for themselves. Um, but yet, it's still an ordinance that uh, you know that that you know you are responsible for clearing the sidewalk in front of your property. But they recognize that there are people who can't do it, and so therefore they you know they they've organized groups of volunteers to help with that. So looking at you know some potential solutions. 
Um, and and knowing that the the county code is not the only way to do it, that's a, that's a good one, uh, in that it it makes it a, a pretty strong uh, ordinance that needs to be followed. But at the same time, you can also have policies in place that say, you know, here's how we're going to address it as a county. Um, and so sometimes that's a little easier to get uh, to get through than is a, than is an actual ordinance that uh, that speaks to it directly. But Roger probably has more experience at that level than, than I do. Well, you know, the, getting something passed uh, in, in local government is always a, a, a matter of, of building uh, a coalition to, to get to a majority. And the other thing about uh, local government and being a local elected official, it's often been called the art of making enemies because you're, you're going to make somebody unhappy. Um, but the, you know, we, we've got what the law requires in terms of, of keeping pedestrian facilities clear. And if you know there are seniors in the community who um, are not able to move snow or don't want to move snow, there there are things you can do uh, as a government to provide that service. There are also things you can do as a community to provide that service. You know, we um, there are a number of, of, of agencies, public and not for profit and private, that, that look after um, senior citizens and adding managing the snow in front of the house to the list is, is a, a thing to consider. You know, in, in our neighborhood, um, I plow, I shovel the walk in front of my house, but I shovel the walks on either side because I've got people on either side that, that aren't able to do it. And I just, I just know that that's a, a good neighborly thing to do. Um, in university towns, there are, um, are you know, fraternities and, and other groups that um, might be looking for service projects and working with, uh, with seniors and the disabled to clean the snow in front of their houses is, is a way that they can have a positive impact on the communities that they live in. So it's, it's getting that kind of organization together and having that conversation as a community that takes you know somebody being proactive to make that happen because what happens too often in our towns is again we've got an ordinance that was adopted 30 years ago and we've got a community that only cares about it after the snow falls and so having the conversation up front and, and thinking about it proactively is, is something that we're we're beginning to talk about more and more all right. Thank you for your question, Anne. Uh, we do have one more question in the queue. We will take that, and I think the timing will be about perfect. So, uh, Stephanie, if you could announce that question. Your last question comes from Jenna in D.C. Uh, yes, I just wanted to follow up and make sure I understood, Donna, what you said earlier about uh, the Federal Highway guidance on the ADA regarding curb ramps. If a uh, sidewalk is located in a residential area, the sidewalk along the street presumably is private property uh, with, I don't know, easement, but it would be the, the private property owner's responsibility to shovel the sidewalk. Did I hear you say correctly that the curb ramp at the intersection would be the responsibility of the city or county, the local jurisdiction or state jurisdiction? Well, it's probably the case that it, it varies depending on who, on how the, the, the city or county defines uh, those different areas, um, uh, you, know, of, of, you know, when it's private property and, and when it's public. But you can rest assured that when the curb ramp was put in, it wasn't the local property owner who did it. Uh, it was the city or the county who put in the curb ramp to facilitate um, uh, access for people with mobility devices for crossing the street, which is a public uh, right of way. And so that being the case, these, these places that are uh, designed and maintained by the city or county or state um, as being uh, public circulation pathways, so the things that they maintain, the things that they build, they maintain, um, and, uh, and part of that maintenance is snow removal. So, uh, so yes, uh, what I, you know, what I'm, what I'm suggesting is that um, although it may vary a little bit from place to place, ultimately the responsibility of the the pathways under the jurisdiction of the city and county and state is their responsibility to either see to it that whoever's you know leasing that property or using that property does it, or that um, they uh, they uh, send out crews to do it themselves. 
Um, but just like the roadways are public, so so are the crosswalks uh, through through that intersection and the curb ramps to get to those crosswalks. Those are all part of the public right of way. So, so even if the sidewalk is not public, the curb ramp would be public. Correct. Interesting. All right. Thank you so much, Shannon, for your question. I really appreciate that. Um, thank you also to everyone else um, who asked your questions. Very. Um, uh, uh, great questions as well as a uh, good presentation. So um, unfortunately, we have reached um, the end of the session today. I just have a couple of uh, closing comments before we end. Um, we do really appreciate your feedback. Um, we take it very seriously and use it to uh, try to improve future sessions. So please take a few moments to um, give us your feedback uh, with uh, a short evaluation of the session. Um, the link is on the screen right now. I will also email um, the link to the um, uh, evaluation to all of those uh, that registered for the session today. So you'll get that uh, via email as well. Um, I do want to thank our presenters uh, for uh, joining us today, uh, as well as all of the participants. Uh, thank you as well for joining us. Um, Donna and Roger, I just want to see if you have any closing comments. Um, I uh, thank you for the opportunity. I learned something just looking at the chat that's going on. Kathy in New Haven talked about an online system that they're using called C Click Fix, where um, you can report something and they put out a call for volunteers to go help at specific locations. So using social media and the internet to identify and solve these problems is, is something that frankly I hadn't considered until just now. So you learn something every day. <laughs> One of my favorite parts uh, about these sessions is that we all learn from each other. Absolutely. And I just want to thank everybody for taking the time to be a part of the call and, and thank Roger and Russ for uh, adding their uh, level of knowledge uh, about this to it. And um, uh, remind you that we do have, that Project Action does have the uh, brief now on snow removal um, that's available for download. So please check that out. Um, let us know what you think about it. We like feedback on our products as well. Um, and please make use of it. And if you have any uh, questions, uh, please feel free to call our hotline um, and get in touch with us. We're happy to, uh, to chat with anybody directly about uh, these issues as well. Thank you, Donna. The, the phone number uh, to our hotline, as Donna just mentioned, um, is actually on the screen right now. It's 1-800-659-6428. Uh, but thank you again for your participation today. Um, please watch our website, which is projectaction.org, uh, and your email for future Easter Seals Project Action uh, events. Uh, but most importantly, thank you for your commitment to increasing and improving accessible transportation in your community. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect. Presenters, please hold the line.